Good afternoon, and thank you for coming at short notice. Um, the subject of uh, dynamics control and its impact on um, vehicle CO2 emissions, we could think of in a very general context. Um, I'm only going to address it in terms of technical issues. By general context, I mean the sociological implications, the societal implications. We could actually think in terms of controlling behaviour, which would have a large impact on reduction of carbon emissions. But I'm going to leave that to economists, uh, social scientists, to uh, promoters of social justice, because at the very end of the day, this issue is really one of social justice. But as I say, I'm only going to talk about the technical issues. So what's the motivation? Well, we all know about carbon dioxide. It's an important contributor to global warming. And there are around 20 serious threats that have been predicted and some of those threats are already being realized. Vehicles, uh, useful sources of mobility, they are fashion items. Trouble is that about 99% of vehicles used on the planet at the moment emit uh, carbon dioxide and other quite harmful gases. Subject of dynamics and control are well-established disciplines in quite a lot of areas. I mean, most of the people would just think of them in terms of engineering, but physicists are also users of dynamics and control, mathematicians, even social scientists are heavy users of principles of dynamics. And what I'm going to talk about today is how we can use those disciplines to reduce uh, carbon emissions at relatively low cost. Let's just look at the um, global carbon emissions at present. This shows the annual emissions over the past um, 60 years, and we can see there's just a continual growth. And you can see who the uh, main emitters are. And this figure shows um, the average um, temperature rise across the globe from about seven different sources. You'd notice two of them are important US sources, NASA um, and DRA. And this is measured as the difference from the average between uh, 1980 and 2000 and uh, 10, so it's zero round about here, and we're seeing a continuous trend upwards. What this shows is the cumulative carbon emissions, and it is in fact um, a linear fit to the measured cumulative emissions, and that has a coefficient of determination of um, 0.998, so it's a pretty good linear fit. And if you project that fit uh, to the climate cliff of between 425 and 450 parts per million, if it's business as usual, we, we'll reach that cliff in about 2038. And that is a point of runaway emissions, in other words, runaway uh, global warming, in which case we may not be able to reverse the process. So it's a pretty serious climate cliff to reach. Where are we in terms of numbers? Well, we currently have about a billion cars in the world. The OECD prediction for 2050 is 2 billion. And you'll see in the UK and in many uh, of the developed countries that transport is the largest source of carbon emissions and is going to continue to grow in terms of the proportion because the energy supply is being greened up. That's much easier to do. 
much more difficult with transport. So it's a big issue. It's the major source of carbon emissions in most developed countries, which are the major sources of carbon dioxide. What have the, um, the IPCC recommended, International Government, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change? They're recommending a 45% cut of the 2000 level by 2030 and zero, net zero by 2050. And they're deadly serious about that figure. In terms of uh, technological development, we've got to look at the so-called technological readiness levels. Uh, these are widely used amongst the automotive and aerospace industries, and they measure how far up the scale you are in terms of techni technical development of a product. Now, just look at these time scales. From one to three, that's typically four years, and that's to, um, from proven concept, four years, a further seven years to get to the point where you are ready to commercialize the, the development, and then another seven years beyond that to 50% market penetration. 20 years from the idea to 50% market penetration. So beyond that, you're going to start to have impact in terms of whatever technical development it is. So I'm going to consider three questions and their answers. And the first one is how much CO2 does a vehicle generate and how is it measured? It's a very uh, pertinent subject. Uh, then what are our current, current regulations and targets like and how good is our track record? How well are we doing? And then the third question is how can we cut uh, CO2 emissions in the short and the long term? So very important questions. The answer to the first question is very easy. You can very easily calculate the amount of CO2 you generate and for a gallon of gasoline that produces about nine kilograms of CO2. And diesel's just uh, slightly, slightly more. If you drive a gasoline vehicle producing 160 grams per kilometer of CO2 for 10,000 miles, I drive a car that produces that amount, but I don't drive it for 10,000 miles, it's more like 2,000, uh, you'll generate two and a half tons of CO2. To offset that, you need to plant four trees every year. So if you are driving uh, a vehicle of that sort, and most people are, you need to be planting four trees per annum, which runs into the billions, if you think globally. You've got to green up the planet. Everybody's talking about electrical ve electric vehicles. How much CO2 do they generate? Well, certainly not zero. And the figures I've seen are of the order eight tons of CO2 before they've even le left the factory. And obviously it depends on how you recharge. But they're not zero. Ideally we'd like to, and, and one day all vehicles will be electric, but at present the uh, solutions on offer are not zero emitting. So next question is how are they measured? And the European Union is very active on this subject. And they introduced a new, what's known as a drive cycle in September last year. And this is the drive cycle. And what it's called is the Worldwide Harmonized Light Vehicle Test Procedure, the WLTP. And what they do is on what's known as a chassis dynamometer, they put the vehicle through a range of speeds and loads. And this is the speed range they go through. And the test takes half an hour. It's under very carefully controlled conditions. And they measure the CO2 and other emissions. And it's used as a benchmark for a particular model of vehicle. It's not what they actually emit in real driving conditions. And to get a measure of that, they're introducing a new test in September 2019 called the 
real driving emissions test, the RDE test, and that will give a better measure of what vehicles really emit on the road. But this one is usually just to benchmark vehicles so you can compare across a range of different vehicles. So how are we doing? Well, this figure on the left shows the historical emissions and the targets using the earlier drive cycle, not the one I've just discussed, but an earlier one called the NEDC, the New European Drive Cycle. It's not new anymore, it was about 19 years old. But you can see that the targets, 2015 target, we're actually below that in Europe. And then there's the 2021 target, which is a drop down to 95 grams per kilometre. And that's the target for 2025, 2030, and so on. But they've ditched that drive cycle. So we ought to look at the new drive cycle. And there's the new drive cycle. That's the old one. This is the new figure on the new drive cycle. And so the new targets are going to be all measured according to that. Now the first problem is, if you project that target down, where does it cross through zero? And it crosses through zero at 2060, which is in fact 10 years after the, the IPCC have recommended. So the European Parliament is going to have to do something about that. And that will have to obviously be uh, a tighter measure that, that uh, will bring us to zero by 2050, if not before. It's very likely that there will be, uh, that date will be brought forward. A little bit about energy and power, because you might not necessarily be uh, engineers or physicists. So just to draw your attention to the various measures, the first one being energy, it's the ability to do work or the rate of doing work, sorry, the ability to do work, um, measured in, in joules as the unit, but sometimes we use the uh, unit kilowatt hours. You've often seen that on things like gas bills. One kilowatt hour is 3.6 mega, mega, megajoules, sorry. Power is the rate of doing work. It's the rate at which you use energy, and that is measured in watts, the unit. Right? So what's our average baseload power in the UK per household? It is actually one kilowatt, not that high. What's the national grid power demand? It's that figure, 52.7 gigawatts. So it's, it's a big number, 10 to the power nine watts a gigawatt. The Saturn V rocket, the most powerful vehicle ever built, although NASA are building one more powerful, it, it, it is at launch input power 852 gigawatts. That's nearly 15 times the total UK output power yeah, from one rocket at launch. So when they refer to rocket science, that's exactly what they mean, okay? It's huge power, but it only lasts for, you know, barely a minute, and it's, you know, already beyond the speed of sound, right, on its way up. Road vehicles actually don't need that much power just to propel them along the flat, and it's about 20 kilowatts, just to overcome what's known as the rolling resistance to drive along at about 50 kilometers per hour, about 30 miles an hour, 20 kilowatts, which in terms of the force, to give you some idea, it's about the weight of two adults pulling the vehicle along, just overcoming the resistance. So it's not huge, but it's not nothing. Okay? Now, the efficiency of a machine is the ratio of power out of a power in. What you pay for is the power in. You obviously want the efficiency to be as high as possible because the power in is the power out of the efficiency. Make that very large and you will obviously have to pay for less power in. So to reduce the power in, just make it more efficient. That's the simple rule. The problem is, is there are certain laws of thermodynamics that we can't ignore 
and they pose limits on the efficiency of heat engines in particular and that depends on the ratio of uh, sink and source temperatures so it's a law of physics we can't break that law and there are as I say uh, certain constraints which are dominated by the choice of materials for example so that's a little bit of the physics that's relevant so the question is how can we cut CO2 emissions from vehicles in the short and long term there's only two ways to do it you can either remove the carbon from the energy source in the first place that's used to power the vehicle or you can improve the vehicle efficiency those are the only two ways of doing it but if we just focus on the main drivers that encourage the take up of technology that will cut CO2 emissions the first one's economics and that's via improved fuel economy but that is not cost effective when fuel is cheap and you might not think so but fuel is actually very cheap so it's not very effective and indeed if you fit retrofit a technical solution and you want to recover the cost of that techni technical solution by improved fu fuel economy it has to be very low cost typically less than a thousand pounds otherwise why would you do it so economics at the present time with cheap fuel is not a good way to cut carbon emissions regulation is where you agree like the European Union on carbon emissions and you impose a levy a tax on the vehicle and there's a very sophisticated tax regulation for vehicles in Europe but it's regulation all that happens is that the manufacturers of vehicles that emit over the limit they simply pass on that tax to the customer and if you are buying a vehicle that is expensive that cost added cost is not really something that you are that concerned by so the regulations are not really that effective either legislation is where you impose a complete ban on emissions and that would have to be international and that would be effective but there are obvious limitations to what you can legislate against now two bits of technical information all road vehicles currently require an energy store of some sort you might not recognize your energy store on your vehicle but you've got one and you've got an energy converter so let's just look at the different types of energy store so there are some numbers these are important forms of energy store the familiar ones would be uh, fuel gasoline fuel for example it's the most common one or diesel fuel and this figure is important in other words the amount of energy you can store in a kilogram of that type of store because the more you can store in it the more useful it is and you'll see that uh, gasoline which is there stores 46.4 megajoules per kilogram and diesel that figure hydrogen is great in terms of specific energy by, by mass but at 900 bar which is quite high pressure the energy density per volume <coughs> is not very good at all storing it in a, a, a vessel at 900 bar is also expensive so hydrogen which is promoted as one of the energy vectors available is not that easy to to take up it's there and it could come but it has its technical limitations by contrast lithium iron which is our main now main uh, source of battery storage you'll see that the figures that's the 
energy stored per kilogram compared with fuel is of the order thousand times smaller. So you need a lot of mass to be able to store enough energy to be able to propel the vehicle over a certain range. And that's one of the problems. So we've got all these different, another one is flywheel, which is available. It's used, it has been used on Formula One cars. It's been considered for conventional vehicles and electric. It's a competitor to Lydia Bayern. It's not without its problems because we'll see later they do have their safety issues and they're expensive, but they're one of the options available. So one of the configurations available at present is a matter of interest. For those who drove here today, some of you drove here? Put your hand up if you drove here. Drove here? Anyone else drove here? What kind of vehicle did you drive in? Uh, it's a diesel. A diesel? Yeah. So it's a conventional vehicle. Yeah. But we can't Esri. share most of the time. Yeah. So <laughs> Benzene, it's very unusual. Yeah. Gasoline. Gasoline. Gasoline, yeah. Like most people, when I gave the talk to um, the main audience, I think everybody had driven a conventional vehicle. Only, only one person actually had driven a hybrid vehicle. Nobody had driven an electric vehicle. So the majority of cars are up in this category, conventional vehicles. And what do you have? You have a fuel tank, an engine and a transmission system and some wheels. That's it. That design has been around for how long since Carl Benz invented the uh, petrol-driven vehicle in, 19, in 1860. No, 1886. Beg your pardon, 1886. The internal combustion engine was invented in 1860 by Lenoir, right? So we've had that architecture around for a very long time. We're starting to see hybrid vehicles. So what do we have there? We have uh, an engine, a transmission, so you have a very similar system to a conventional vehicle, but in parallel to that, you have an energy store. And you can either drive the vehicle from the energy store, and you can regenerate during braking into the energy store. So it's actually carrying two, what's known as two powertrains at the same time. And that's known as the parallel architecture, parallel. Most hybrid vehicles are of that sort. Their days are numbered. What we're seeing is uh, more use of series hybrid being considered and that one exists already, it's the BMW i3, and that is a prize-winning vehicle. And the advantage of that is that as battery technology evolves, we can start to use the uh, generator, which is, can be an IC engine or a fuel cell, less and less, and make it smaller, until we can actually dispense with it altogether, in which case we end up with um, a battery electric vehicle which just comprises a battery and a motor, motors and a transmission system and hopefully all vehicles will be of that type one day and they will emit nothing how they manage the zero emission uh, manufacture of the battery with zero emissions I don't know the answer to that question yet maybe we will start to see increasing use of fuel cells. The problem is fuel cell is extremely expensive at present, but it could come about and that would run on largely on hydrogen. But as I've said, hydrogen's not without its problems for a variety of reasons. Now this figure shows um, a hierarchy of decision, uh, for decision making. And this is really um, something that's come from the energy generators, you know, the people who generate the electricity for the grid, and their strategy is the first port of call if you want to cut carbon emissions is energy saving. Switch off. That's the most sensible thing to do. The next level is energy efficiency improvements. 
make all your appliances more efficient. If you can't do that, then switch to renewals, and then it's starting to get quite expensive. Yeah, but that's what you should be doing if you can't do these two. Then you're down to carbon capture, which is very expensive, but you know, potentially a good route forward. If you can't do any of those things, then use conventional technology. Unfortunately, in terms of transport, that's exactly where we are. 99% of the population are using conventional powertrain. So we're in the wrong place. We should really be up there. But we're right at the bottom at present. Now, the thing is at the moment, grid power, transport and heating, big users of energy, are all completely separate, completely disconnected. By 2050, they need to be totally integrated. So we're going to see, see some quite significant infrastructure changes in the next 30 years. Now, in the medium term, medium term between now and 20, let's say 2035, 20, 2040, the best route to decarbonising transport is by aggressive efficiency improvements, which mean a big switch to hybrid electric vehicles. Electric vehicles in their own right will, will increase in usage, but the short, the short to medium term, big use of hybrid. So I'd say in the next five years, there's going to be a huge change to hybrid. Now, in that area, the disciplines of dynamics and control have got a big role to play. So what, uh, what are these subjects? Well, dynamics is actually an ancient discipline, as we'll see, and it's had some pretty big names working in it over the years. Control is more recent, and what does that involve? It involves the theoretical study of abstract mathematical processes to meet specific requirements, and we'll see what they are. It's different from control engineering, which is the technology associated with implementing the control theory. There are companies now that just focus on this, and they employ a lot of people. It's one in particular in the automotive sector. It's called D-Space. It's a German company. They employ 1,000 people just to do this. And there are several competitors. So it's a big area making it happen. So what about dynamics? What is it? Well, let me just check. Dynamics. Who's, who's made a contribution to dynamics? This is not a definitive list, but it's a few of the important people. Galileo is quite well known. Galileo was the father of structural mechanics. Did quite a lot on dynamics as well. But of course he didn't have the laws of physics at that point, at least correctly stated. That relied on Newton, Isaac Newton, well known for a variety of things. Daniel Bernoulli made a huge contribution to this step. In other words, going from the physics of a particle, particle motion, to the dynamics of structures in three dimensions, beams, plates, rotor ship, aircraft, spacecraft, cars, engine, offshore structures, robots. So this is what these people did. They took it from Newton's correct statement for particle, the three laws of, of uh, dynamics, through to applications which can involve just about any machine that you're ever likely to, to need to work on. Leonard Euler, considered by mathematicians to be the most important mathematician ever to have lived. Yeah. Lagrange was, in fact, not French, although he sounds French, he was Italian, made a huge contribution. Laplace, a Frenchman, also huge. Sophie Germain was the first to develop a rigorous plate theory. Coriolis 
made a huge contribution to rotary motion that affects everything including the climate. And then you've got more recent people like Mathieu, I just had a project student developed an example, a demonstrator for the Mathieu equation. Lord Rayleigh, uh, a Brit that contributed to massive areas in dynamics and thermodynamics. Timoshenko was a Ukrainian. When I was an undergraduate, Timoshenko was the guru in engineering. And then more recently, the Dutch-American Den Hartog. But there's others. What about the nationalities? Italian, British, Swiss, Swiss, Italian, uh, French, 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 British, Ukrainian, Dutch American. Very European, if you think about it. So what does it involve, dynamics? Well, it involves first applying laws of physics, and you end up, well, the one, one approach, apply the laws of physics, end up with a model for a machine or structure. There's another approach, which is quite common, and that is you take a real system that you're trying to get an understanding of, and you excite it, and then you measure the responses, and then you go through a process of identification. And this is a big area now in artificial intelligence. It's known as machine learning. So a lot of computer scientists are developing techniques, such as things like neural networks, which are very heavily used now in this process. So you can get this model either from physics or from this machine learning process. And when you've got that model, you can then start to use it in analysis and you can come out with an understanding of the phenomenon that you're trying to get a handle of and then you can either accept or refine a design and this is now part of the process whether it's an aircraft or a car they, we go through this process and it's iterative and you get 99 percent of the way there in some applications like the Boeing um, Sorry, the Airbus A380, A380, the super jumbo, was actually sold long before they'd ever even built a prototype based on prediction. Obviously, there are some things you can't predict, but most of the way you get there with modeling. Control that subject about doing things and uh, making sure that they do what you want them to do Essentially, you take that process that, if I just go back, so there's my model, which I'm going to call a process. So I'm going to take that process, which is a model for my system, and I'm going to consider a controller, which is the brains of what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to desire an output. So the process of control is essentially to measure the response and make a comparison with what I'd like and then put it into this brain box which is usually a computer and then that applies actuates the process to try and get it to do what I want so in a sense that is the entirety of control as a theory and as I said there's a huge amount of technology involved in getting the measurements and getting the controller to actually be implementable. So it's a big subject. So who's made a contribution to control? Well, it starts out with a mathematician called Stern, way back in the 19th century, and then some uh, contributions from people who are still used, actually, in control theory. But there's a big name, a physicist called James Clark Maxwell, who created some equations called Maxwell's equations, electrodynamic equations. And he actually first studied control of steam engines. So digressed a little bit, but made an important contribution. And then there was another name that's only heard in control theory called Hervitz. And then two brothers called the Wright brothers, who were the first to invent um, aircraft. They solved the three-axis control problem. They're considered by aeronautical engineers to be the fathers of aeronautical engineering. Big contribution. 
And then we start to get people like Minorsky who uh, studied the problem of directional control of ships and then another name in control theory and another name in control theory and then somebody called Pontryagin who was a Russian who started with the subject of optimal control and what was amazing you'll notice he looks slightly squint and that was because as a teenager he was exposed to a primus stove explosion which resulted in complete blindness and he thereafter did all his work blind and his proof for Pontryagin's maximum principle runs to six pages of A4 and it's extremely complicated mathematics but he did all that blind so really there's no obstacle uh, to development from disabled people and he was one and then we've got Bellman who <coughs> developed what's known as dynamic programming during the Second World War huge contribution and then somebody in more recent years called uh, Kalman who developed a filter which is used every time you land an airport there's a Kalman filter working a way to make sure you land safely and finally uh, Nichols another one who's made a huge contribution so these are not, it's not a definitive list of contributors but certainly important contributions Recently we've had a problem in the news and we've had um, two incidences where there have been total uh, fatalities on both aircraft. Now what was, what's the problem? The problem was to do with, um, to do with the lift or what is actually known as stall. And the problem is, is that if you look at the lift from an Air Force section, the wing is an Air Force section, and you, you look at how that lift varies with the angle of attack. The problem is, is that if you go to too large an angle of attack, this lift drops off, and what's known as the Air Force section stalls, so you lose lift entirely, and that would mean that the aircraft will drop. Now, the problem with the control system, since we're talking about control on that particular aircraft, was that when it um, indicated that there was a loss of lift, it actually reduced the angle of attack. But if the aircraft was already flying horizontally in the first place, to reduce the angle of attack means go into a dive. And that's exactly what happened. And it seemed that the pilots were not able to uh, over, override that, which had catastrophic consequences. And that was a control problem. But that's not the main reason I'm showing that. I'm showing that because, in fact, there's a related problem to do with airfoil sections on aircraft. And the most stringent test that an aircraft is put through is, is known as the flutter test. All new models of aircraft are put through a flutter test. And flutter is an aerodynamic instability which can occur more frequently than, than you can imagine. The Boeing A3, the Boeing um, 777 failed the flutter test at first. The Super Jumbo, the Airbus A380, failed the flutter test. The stealth bomber failed the flutter test. So this is quite common. And in some cases you can fix it, but in other cases it can be catastrophic. And when they test these aircraft models, the crew, the flight crew, wear crash helmets and parachutes. And that included the A380, which failed the flutter test, but fortunately they were able to get down and fix the problem. A little bit about teaching, because here at Sussex, I teach a, a module which is M level, fourth year students, and I get them to do some aeroelastic instability analysis. But I arrange it so that they can choose what they do, and this was the cohort of students, 46 students, chose their different aircraft uh, and other applications because some looked at wind turbine blades and uh, 
um, airfoil sections on Formula, car, uh, Formula student cars. But it just shows the range of possibilities and they all went away and managed to get all the data they needed to do the uh, stability analysis on these applications. So it's actually very motivating that they do something that is very critically important for aircraft development. Just throw that one in. The most important people in universities are PhD students when it comes to actually doing the work. And this was a group of PhD students with whom I had the pleasure of meeting over many thousands of hours. And fortunately, most of them have gone off with a PhD and are doing amazing things elsewhere. So back to vehicle technology and reduction of carbon emissions. What can we do to reduce uh, carbon emissions? As I said, the best way is to remove the carbon from the fuel source in the first place. And zero carbon emissions vehicles would be using, for example, hydrogen, because there's no carbon in hydrogen. And the fuel cell is your best route there. So that may come. The alternatives, as I said, are improvements in efficiency and there's a whole array of possibilities that will give you between 1% and 80% cut in carbon emissions. The first one would be um, you know, sustainable manufacturing techniques where you look at recycling. I mean, that would be a very good way. But then there's a whole thing, you know, hybrid powertrains, um, light weighting, that's a big subject, make vehicles lighter, use different materials, regenerative braking, all the way down to autonomous vehicles, and that's a huge area at the moment. I think I get invited to a different autonomous vehicle conference every day. It's that busy at the moment. I don't go to any of them, yeah, because there are just so, so many. Platooning, that's the, that's the big issue. Okay, how good is platooning? <coughs> well, on vehicles, there are people who claim D-Space being one of them uh, in combination with various universities. You can get a 20% cut just by platooning. And that is you're making very heavy use of connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles. So you essentially get the vehicles to all communicate with each other so that they won't be accelerating and decelerating. They'll be merging with traffic. 20%, that's what they claim. On heavy duty, that's uh, articulated trucks, you'd think that there would be benefits as well. There's a truck, that is a 2018 Mercedes truck, the Actros, yeah, a 41 ton truck. Right? It would collapse the bridge in Lewis if you drove one of these. You know they've crossed the railway station? That will take, I think, 11 tons. So a 41 truck, it would collapse the bridge. I was surprised at that. But Mercedes, being um, quite astute developed, developers of products, put through this vehicle through autonomous connected vehicle tests, and they found they barely, barely got 1% improvement. So some of these um, options are not necessarily attractive when you thoroughly test them. And that's what engineers do. They test things. They propose a solution, and they test them. So not everything is as rosy as you might think. Light weighting, I was involved in a European Union contract. I was the, the uh, PI, principal investigator, on a European contract that lasted for four years. Um, and we were looking at reducing the weight of vehicles. Again, it runs into all kinds of problems because once you make them lighter, you run into noise and vibration problems. And it's not as simple as it might seem. But, um, They've reduced the weight of a lot of vehicles by well over 100 kilograms over the past 10 years. And for every kilogram you reduce the weight, you get a carbon uh, reduction in carbon emissions. So it will continue using things like carbon fibers. Optimal control. It's a big subject, and I'm not going to go into the detail, but what it is essentially is when I mentioned the models that you generate through dynamic analysis and so on, you can represent those mathematically in a very elegant form called a state space model. 
And the whole purpose of optimal control is to minimise what's known as a cost function or an objective function, subject to a whole bag of constraints. So in principle, what you can do is you could pose the question, if I have a vehicle and I have a model for the vehicle and I know what all the constraints are, can I re reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide? And that's an optimal control problem. So there's an example where we could use optimal con control theory to reduce vehicle emissions. And we've actually used some of these techniques and there are some mathematical techniques available and we've used all of those techniques on particular problems. An example, just to give you some idea of the problem, is using dynamic programming, which is Bellman's approach, discretize, and it throws up some interesting computer science problems because this is actually quite a simple problem and we've crudely approximated what's known as the state space in this case there are only two states and we've chosen just nine discrete states in both dimensions and five in this example five discrete time steps and we end up with how many paths over 10 to the power 16 paths to examine and this is a very good way of doing it. But um, even if you've got you know, quantum computing, you run up against some really serious computing problems using these kind of techniques. Where did we apply it to? This is known as a KERS, a Kinetic Energy Recovery System. And they've been using these on Formula One cars to improve performance, not to reduce emissions uh, this thing is made of carbon fibre and it spins to 60,000 RPM. So there's a risk it would burst and, you know, you could store all the energy in a, you know, big Mercedes travelling at 100 miles an hour in one of these things. So you can imagine if that burst, it would do a lot of damage. And what we were trying to do here was to consider how we control this thing, which is known as a CVT, a continuously variable transmission which you have to have one of the with one of these things is like a variable speed gearbox how do you control that in order to minimize the losses in the system because you want to recover all the energy that you've put into the flywheel if you're doing that lots of times then you obviously want to get back what you put in so uh, yeah we looked at that problem and we came out with a very interesting solution which showed in fact that using optimal control had a massive impact on the amount of energy that you didn't lose. So it's a good way of doing it. Just looking at combustion engines, which is still a very big area and can, going to continue to be when we're using combustion engines in hybrid. And in hybrid, what we're trying to do is make these things as small and as compact and as efficient as possible. So that's make them small because then you don't have to carry them around because you remember when I talked about the configuration of the different possibilities if we're going to go for something that allows the transition to all electric from hybrid then that's got to be small and these are the options you may actually be driving a car with stop start already so you go to the traffic lights and it shuts down and then starts when you put your foot back on the on the accelerator there are CVTs around continuously variable transmissions around for uh, conventional vehicles. There's all of these different technologies that uh, they have advantages, disadvantages, but we are exploring all of them. But what happens when you make engines small? Well, unfortunately, the efficiency goes down. Small engines are not efficient. So eng really small engines we're talking 25% efficient at the most. A, a state-of-the-art gasoline engine, 100 kilowatts, will be about 40% efficient. But small engines, you're very lucky to get 25%. And all of those measures can be applied to small engines, so to make them more efficient. I was involved in a project for a very long time with Jaguar Land Rover for about 12 years. And what we we're trying to do was, using indirect sensing, measure the pressure inside the cylinder of a four-stroke engine. And 
the benefits of doing that is if if you can uh, measure the instantaneous cylinder pressure in an engine on all the cylinders and balance them you get roughly a 10% improvement in fuel efficiency you can use sensors to do it but they're expensive they cost about 1500 pounds each and they don't last very long so your um, service bill would be huge so there's no big take up on diesel there is some some cars are fitted with these sensors but nowhere on uh, volume produced gasoline engines so we're working on that problem using other sensors that are already fitted to the engine and we've had huge amounts of success with that particular development but it took 12 years and four PhDs and it's not finished yet okay. and that was actually the measurement system these things take enormous amount of time to set up so we had a, a system data acquisition and lots of hardware and computing and it took the person to do that about 18 months to actually get that working and he did he's still working for me actually now yeah, which is good yeah I obviously haven't upset him too much uh, this is a project and uh, one of the team is in here at the present just show at the back there yeah. but this is the team and the problem is this we're trying to dispense with the use of liquid cooling in conventional engines so rather than have liquid cooling we're going to have um, a coolant that actually evaporates once it makes contact with the hot surface so imagine this is the wall of a, uh, a cylinder of an engine and you've got combustion so you've got temperatures here anything up to 2000 degrees Kelvin and you've got heat that you need to remove and you need to remove that heat to meet, to meet the requirements of the laws of thermodynamics so we remove that heat using vapour which actually is advantageous because it uses the latent heat of vaporisation which is a very efficient way of removing heat and we've got to make this into a cycle so we have a nozzle it sprays liquid onto the surface which evaporates and then we condense it and we bring it back into a cycle and the little droplets are tiny 50 microns in diameter very small so the physics of this problem to complicate it this wall vibrates at various amplitudes and frequencies so we're actually making progress on this problem and it's a control problem essentially but the physics of this process is also very complicated especially when you have an oscillating boundary but the team are making very good progress we've got engine consultants we've got um, uh, experts on heat transfer and PhD students and a great technician who will not put his photograph on uh, Sussex Direct yeah, that's why he's absent and we've actually had uh, partners involved with this particularly Ford and Ricardo and Denso which is a Toyota subsidiary and Ford built this actually manufactured this uh, mock cylinder head for us at Dunton in Ford uh, so we've had very good uh, partner collaboration on, on this project and we're very nearly there another project which is ongoing at present is um, to actually develop a resonant free piston engine and I've got four patents with the university on related technology and we've got a very good team working on this at present uh, it's got some hidden difficulties which we will solve and uh, create this um, very small generator, high efficiency small generator so that's that, that work going on and the team is interdisciplinary ranging from electrical machine experts to combustion specialists and that's the technology with the four patterns and this person Peter Lane is in the innovation centre here and he's a, an innovation consultant he has been so supportive of me in this development whereas most people sort of uh, I won't explain how it works because I don't fully understand myself um, whereas most people just look baffled at this uh, innovation uh, Peter's been solid supporter throughout 
and uh, it's got to the point where we've got funding. We started out trying to get funding over several years and now we have funding and so it's making, making good progress. Some final thoughts. Uh, and these are sort of just uh, captions of experience and the first thing is that students and researchers are a huge inspiration to developing new ideas. Great. It's always great to work with students because they bring, uh, they think out of the box and they come laterally at the problem. And as I say, academic freedom is paramount. Yet, it's real problems that are the most academically challenging. And that's paradoxical, really. You have to maintain those two, two balances. Uh, but in terms of where we're going to over the next 30 years, this is not business as usual. The whole subject of climate change is massively important. But those two disciplines are going to have a big role to play, especially when they integrate, integrate grid, transport and heat. They will play a huge part. Now I think the problem is of such magnitude, and there are people who are seeing it that way, is of such magnitude that it almost requires military intervention to address climate change. That's almost paradoxical in a sense, but nonetheless it's of that seriousness. And here's a few thoughts from various military people. General uh, von Moltke was a First World, general, First World War general. No battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Eisenhower Overall, overall responsibility for D-Day. Plans are worthless. Planning is everything. Yeah. And George Patton. Good plan, violently executed now. Better than a perfect plan, executed next week. Almost contradictory, but a great way to end. Yeah. Thank you kindly.